It was a refreshing time to come to the Lord's table, is it not? I'm sure he intended that for us as we come. Would you stand with me as we read from the fifth chapter of James? Beginning in verse 7, the Lord says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the earthly, it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Spound prayer. Should we, Father, we thank you for this word. We ask now that you will illuminate to our hearts and lives, cause us not just to be hearers of the word, but doers as well. And um, Father, help us to understand the empower, empowerment that's required to follow your directions. We realize it will not come from us alone, it must come from your spirit. And so we pray that we will be faithful to submit ourselves to you as we understand what the requirement is. And so give us understanding this morning and give us, Lord, the will to obey, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you are not already, please turn with me to James chapter 5. It's just not fair, right? How often have you heard that phrase? Perhaps you've even said it a time or two in your life. We find that life is filled with big and little personal things of injustice that go on, right? Whether perceived or real, we find also that these injustices hurt. They're painful. And yet they are inevitably the result of the broken and fallen world in which we all live, right? The book of Job says in Job 5, verses 6 and 7, for affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble sprout from the ground, but man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. As sure as that's the case, the sparks fly upward, surely we're going to have trouble and be treated unfairly. And Job was certainly learning that as he spoke those words. Now, how do we handle it then when we've been treated personally unfairly? How do we deal with the injustices of life? How, how do we deal with it when somehow we've gotten the short end of the stick? Do we set our offenders straight, give them peace of our mind? Do we defend our rights? All of these would be very human reactions, right? Also, they would be very wrong. James goes in a different direction. He saw unfairness. He saw that the people to whom his, he was writing were experiencing it. And he's, he's not really talking about uh, unfairness from outsiders here. He's talking, that, that's also part of life. But this is people within the church. This is people, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, that this is going on. Now, certainly we can talk to them and we can try and figure out what's going on. But James has some instructions that's going to be very important for us here. So we're going to see over the next couple of times that we look at this passage, the exhortation, the encouragement, and the examples that he's going to give us. It's another lesson, as, you, as we've seen all the way through James. James seems like he hit us between the eyes every week, right? Maybe not you, but certainly it seems that way to me. But he's going to teach us another principle here in kingdom living, which differs from worldly living. It's almost always exactly the opposite. You can almost count on that. So how do we bear the image of God with patience, with humility, and courage in the midst of an unfair world? When it's not fair, a couple of weeks that we want to spend on that. Today we want to look at the exhortation, and uh, that'll take us as far as we need to go. I want to see the context, first of all. The context is this. If you remember, James has been talking to the people in the, at the beginning of this chapter, at the beginning of chapter five, about the fact that they are, some of them may be miserably rich. Miserably rich meaning not necessarily that they have a lot of money, but these are people who love money. And somehow that has overtaken some of them. And James has challenged them 
to examine their life to see if this might be a, an indication that their faith is not real. And he's pretty hard in his words there. He says, come now, you rich. It's a different tone when we get to verse seven. In verse seven, when he urges those who have been offended, he says, be patient, therefore, brothers. You can almost hear the compassion in his voice as he says, not seek justice, the normal human reaction, but be patient, be patient. Do something that's different than you would expect and that's different than your natural inclination. Here's the kingdom response to unfairness, be patient. Now we're gonna see that James' instruction comes in two parts. The one deals with inside us, inward, the other outward. And I think basically what he's saying here is you get the inward right and the outward will tend to follow suit. So we'll spend most of our time about the inward thing. And the inward is just be patient. Inwardly, that's what we are to do. He hammers this point home. He says in verse seven, be patient. In verse eight, you also be patient. In verse 10, he gives an example of suffering and patience. Now notice he links suffering and patience. He knows that in order to do this, it is gonna cost something. To be patient in the face of unfairness is hurtful. It's painful. And James is acknowledging, I know that. God, the Holy Spirit through James is acknowledging that. This is gonna be a costly exercise. In verse 10, he speaks of the reward for those who will remain steadfast. In verse 11, he uses Job as an example of steadfastness. James is a realist. He knows the natural reaction is gonna be to come out with all guns blazing, right? When we've been treated unfairly. It will be hard to be patient. And yet this is the instruction of our Lord and Master, patience. Now the word that James uses here is comprised of two words, one first Part of the word means long, and the second part means temper. He says, I'm, I'm wanting you to be long-fused. It's like when you set an explosive device inside a cave. You don't want to be in there when it goes off. So what do you do? You set a long fuse. And James is saying, that's the way I want you to be when it comes to your reaction to unfairness. My mom would have made it simple. She would have said, don't fly off the handle. I never did know exactly where that phrase came from, but I definitely knew what it meant. One's supposed to get angry and try and set everybody straight. One writer has captured it. I love the way he said it. He said, set the timer on your temper for the long run. Set the timer for your temper for the long run. Wait. You don't have to correct every perceived wrong instantaneously. Now, sometimes it will be that you really have been wrong. Other times it will be that you think you've been wrong, but you really haven't. Either way, James is saying, wait. Give God opportunity before you jump into the fray. I think the only exceptions here, and even these require some waiting, when there's been a, some immoral activity going on that needs to be corrected, we are to jump into the the breach there with the right attitude, a right attitude of trying to restore the one who's there realizing this could be us, and next time it may be. Or when there's been a problem of tainting the gospel, somehow getting the gospel wrong. A lot of ways that could be done that we can't go into this morning, but those two things are kind of exceptions to this. But in general, James is saying, when you see unfairness, stop. Manage your temper. Give God an opportunity to go to work before you jump in. Proverbs 15, 18, read a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he was slow to anger, quiets contention. God is saying, I want you to be a quieter downer, not a stirrer upper. God commends that in Proverbs 16, verse 32. He said, whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He who rolls the spirit then he who takes the city. God is saying, in my value system, 
my way of counting things, I think it's better if you can control your temper than if you can go out and capture a city. It takes, in some ways, more strength to do that. Wait. Steadfast, the word used in verses 10 and 11, has much the same idea. It's the Greek word. We've seen it before. Hupa meno, hupa under meno, to remain. So he's saying, I don't want you to go stir up trouble. I want you to remain under for whatever period of time I allow this to be in your life. It's not that you can't seek redress without anger. It's not that you can't pray about it. But as long as I leave it in your life, you need to be willing to remain under. You need to be steadfast. Believe in me. It's not for you to straighten it out, but to remain under. Giving God opportunity. I can't stress that enough. We're so quick to jump in and try and do God's work. And God's saying, oh, wait a minute, let me have an opportunity at this. And many times we don't see God at work in our life because we don't give him the chance. God's ways are not our ways. His timing is not our timing. And the only way we'll be able to see it is if we're willing to wait. And so God says, I want you to wait. He's going to tell us before we get done with this that there's great reward that attaches to being patient. Whatever pain is involved, it's going to be worth it in the end, in the long run. You can always count on God to make sure that it's whatever he asks you to do to be worth it in the long run. In the short run, it may be costly. We need people, beloved, who will be patient with each other, right? Right? We were talking in the Sunday school class this morning that patience with each other, bearing with each other, is what reveals the character of God. Within the Trinity, you got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a perfect love relationship, right? How many arguments do you think they have? They don't. And if we're going to represent God correctly, we have to be people that are willing to be patient. We're different. We have different pasts, we have different backgrounds, we grew up in different families, we have different financial situations, we have different lifestyles, we have different ethnic backgrounds. We're different in many, many ways and we must learn from each other and we must learn to be patient. Not to jump in right away when something's been wrong. The beauty of the church, listen, and, and God says this in Ephesians 3, if you want to read about it sometime, he says, here's the mystery of the church. Mystery meaning something that was revealed, uh, that was hidden before, but now it's revealed. And he says, the beauty of the church is all these different kind of people living together in harmony. It's beautiful. This is the beauty, the opportunity that God has given us to be patient with those who are different to endure when it's not fair. The world can't do this. The world cannot do this. And God is asking us to do it. These scattered Jewish people that James is addressing are sort of kicking each other around. They're being kicked around by outsiders all over the Mediterranean. They're like a soccer ball, but now they are in somehow having infighting themselves. And James is saying to them, to listen, be patient, be steadfast, endure. Don't think it's your calling to right every wrong the moment it happens. Be patient. You know, you put patience and steadfast together and you get another great biblical word, which is the word forbearance. 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 This is such a challenge to Americans who have been taught that it's our God-given right to pursue justice at any cost. We've kind of been taught that. We've kind of grown up with that. But listen to what God says. In fact, let's turn to it in Ephesians chapter 4. Well, my Bible fell right open to that. I don't know if you've been here, if you've been long enough that you remember Ephesians. But Ephesians chapter 4. Listen to this. Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner... Why does he make it a point that he's a prisoner? Because he's unfairly imprisoned, right? He's not imprisoned because it was right. He's been accused of taking a Gentile into the Jewish part of the temple in Jerusalem. And he's now been in jail by the time he wrote this. He's been in jail between four and five years. Falsely accused. I, a prisoner. But look at this. I, a prisoner for the Lord. 
I'm not just here because Rome decided, the Jewish people in Jerusalem decided, and Rome decided they wanted to imprison me. I'm a prisoner for the Lord because the Lord decided this is what he wants for me. Boy, that's a great way to live, isn't it? When you can see every circumstance in your life as this is what God is deciding for me at this point in time, that is a great place to live. So Paul says, I, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling for which you have been called with all justice and fairness. Is that what he says? No. Here's the manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with, forbearing, bearing with one another in love. In other words, you do it and you do it with enthusiasm. Can you do that? Forbear with enthusiasm? You can't do that, beloved, unless the Lord is living his life through you. It won't work. But that's what Paul's asking. I want you to bear with one another in love, eager, not reluctantly, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In other words, what he's saying is simple terms, take it on the chin for Jesus' sake. That's what it takes. I've told you this before, but this illustrates it so well. You know, Jonathan Edwards, who was arguably, I think most people would say, most historians would say, the greatest theologian and the greatest pastor in American history, Jonathan Edwards. Did you know that Jonathan Edwards was kicked out of his church? He was kicked out of his church. Jonathan Edwards, when he got out of seminary in New England, he went down to New York City for a while and he pastored there for a brief time. And then he came up to be with his grandfather. His grandfather had been a long, well-established, been almost 50 years in his pulpit by that time in Northampton, Massachusetts, at the Congregational Church there. And Jonathan Edwards came up to be his assistant pastor in the early 1720s. By 1729, his grandfather turned it over to him. And so he became the pastor, and things went well for the next 15 years or so. But then Jonathan Edwards, because of his study of the Bible, began to realize, hey, this issue of communion, what we did this morning, celebrating the Lord's table, he began to realize that this is for Christians. And he realized there were people making no profession of faith but wanting to take communion, somehow feeling this made them feel better about themselves. And so he began to establish the principle, if you don't make a profession of faith in Christ, you can't celebrate communion. It led to a two or three year big ruckus. And they wrote papers, they accused each other, they had meetings, all kinds of stuff went on. And eventually he was voted out of that church, the greatest preacher in American history, by a vote of 230 to 29. And then, here's the rest of the story, then they found out it wasn't all that easy to replace him. So they asked him if he wouldn't mind staying on for a while until they could find his replacement. And so for several months, Jonathan Edwards continued with a good spirit, exactly what Ephesians says. He stayed on as their pastor. One eyewitness said this. He said, I never saw Jonathan Edwards display the least symptoms of displeasure in his countenance the whole time. He appeared like a man of God whose happiness was out of the reach of his enemies. I love that. His happiness was out of the reach of his enemies. Why? Because he knew he was a prisoner of God. Not a prisoner of people's opinions. He cared what they thought. Nobody likes to be run down. Nobody likes to be treated unfairly. Nobody likes to take a stand and find out that they're going to be mistreated for it. Nobody likes that. But Jonathan Edwards could do it exactly as the Lord asked him to do it, with gentleness, with patience, and with humility, bearing one another in love. Can you do that? Can we do that? Jonathan Edwards could do that, but he could do that, beloved, because he had made resolutions early in his life under the power of the Holy Spirit. And, he's, and he spent every day, first thing he did, get up in the morning, would be to turn his life over to the Holy Spirit one more time. That's why he could do it, and that's the only way we'll be able to do it. As the Holy Spirit, as the life of, of God is lived out through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And if we don't do that, beloved, a lot of us are gonna have a lot of pettiness to answer for. A lot of churches, a lot of church-going people, a lot of otherwise wonderful people are gonna have a lot of pettiness to answer for. Forbearance. Well, how do you develop this patience? How do you develop this forbearance? Verse eight, back in James chapter five, he says this. He says, you also be patient Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord. Establish. Establish is a word which means to make fast, to confirm, to be resolute, to tie it down to something important. Tie your heart down. Establish it. Have a heart that's committed to where? To the Lord. See yourself as the prisoner of the Lord. See yourself as, as being where God has placed you for whatever reason he's done, even though you may not like it. Patience is an inside job. See, it starts with the heart. And it only starts with a heart that is really committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, that's trusting, not self, but that's looking to God for the answers, that's willing to give him time. The double-minded person is the person who, yeah, on one side he believes God and he trusts God and he says all the right things about God, but when the, when the rubber hits the road, he's over there trying to solve it himself. Listen, James knew all about that. He, he spoke to that. Look, turn, just turn back to the first chapter of James. Look what he says. James chapter one, verse six, he says, when you lack wisdom, when you feel like you've been treated unfairly, when life isn't going the way you want to, Verse six, chapter one, let him ask in faith with no doubting for the one who doubts, doubts what? Doubts that God is able. Not that God's gonna do everything you want him to do, but who doubts that God is able to handle the situation. You don't tie your heart, you don't tie your anchor to how you think this ought to be solved. You tie your anchor to what God is going to do. Do you see? Huge difference. And so James says, the one who is double-minded is like the wave of the sea that is driven and tossed in the wind. He says to that person in verse eight, look at verse eight, that he is double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. It's no wonder we, we want to straighten everybody out. But you, know, you, you know why we do that? Because we fear if we don't do it, nobody will. And we are treading, we are treading on God's territory when we do that. God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, right? We're trespassing on sacred territory when we think it's up to us to straighten it all out. Give it to God, beloved. Let your heart be steadfast. Let it be tied down to him. That's where James is pointing us here. He says in chapter four, verse eight, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Confess your sins. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Get it straight. God is capable, and God is worthy of your trust. And so patience starts when we begin to trust a big God, a God that we know can handle this. A God who is capable, if there's been an injustice, of correcting it. Rather than us doing all the silly little petty things that we do because we got mad at somebody because they treated us wrong. Let me tell you, we're gonna have to answer for a lot. Peter says this in 1 Peter 1, verse six, he says, humble yourselves, not impose yourselves, humble yourselves. This is a humbling thing. That's one reason it's painful, because we don't really do humility well. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. It's a mighty hand. It's a capable hand. It's a sure hand. Yours isn't. Mine isn't. His is. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. So that at the proper time, at the proper time, he makes all you. When's the proper time? For me, the proper time is right now, right? It's not always true for the Lord. 
because he knows we got lessons to learn in the meantime. He knows there's things that we need to be taught. He knows there's experiences we need to go through. And so at the proper time, he'll do the exalting. Casting all your anxieties on him, not on yourself, on him, because he cares for you. Are you, are you sensing a trend yet? How do you have patience? You trust in a big God. If you could trust him to save you, beloved, can't you trust him for the little, smaller issues that come up in life? And I know some of them seem very big. None of them are anything like what it took to save you from your sin. You need to learn to trust him. If anyone had reason to take the law in their own hands, it was David. Turn with me to 1 Samuel 24. 1 Samuel 24. David had been anointed king as a teenager. Saul had already worn out his welcome with the Lord because he failed to obey God. God said, okay, that's it for you. The kingdom is gone. And he had David anointed, but, king is, but, but Saul is still on the throne. He's still ruling. David goes through the time with, you know, the fight with Goliath. He becomes part of the court because he can play the harp and he can calm the spirit that comes upon Saul every once in a while. And Saul was jealous. When there were battles, you know, the, the cry became... Saul has killed his thousands, David has killed his ten thousands, and that irked Saul beyond belief. Probably would you too, if you were Saul. But Saul got so jealous of David that he tried to kill him, as you recall, threw a spear at him as he's playing the harp, not once, but a couple times, and David was on the run. And on one occasion, he was in a cave. Saul was chasing him. Saul came in the cave to relieve himself. Turned out to be the same cave that David and his men were hiding in. He didn't see the men that were in there. It was dark. So in 1 Samuel 24, verse, let's pick it up at verse 4. Some of David's men are saying, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. They're quoting the Bible to him, by the way. Then David rose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. You, recall, you remember this story. He couldn't bring himself to take his life. He could have killed him then and there, but he got conscience stricken. He snuck up behind him, took off a corner of his robe, and then he went back into hiding. So in verse 6, he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord. The Lord's anointed. The Lord's anointed. The Lord's anointed. You know what would stop most church fights? It would be if we all understand that person that we're fighting so hard is the Lord's anointed. Just like I am. Just like you are. But when we begin to see each other as the Lord's anointed, we'll begin to realize, you know what? If there's anything that needs to be straightened out here, God will do it. God can take care of it. God's big enough to handle this. That's David's perspective. That's, that's forbearance with a capital F, is it not? His enemy who was trying to kill him was right there in his sights and he could have taken his life in no time. It wasn't just a case of Saul trying to keep him off a committee or trying to get things to go a certain way. It was a case of he was trying to kill him. Everybody around David would have thought it was within his rights to take Saul's life, but he wouldn't do it. He refused to touch God's anointed, and we need to see each other in the same light, beloved. As God's anointed, as those who have been chosen and elect by God and have been brought into his family, as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, who can represent God correctly if we will, if we will fight for the harmony and unity that should exist, and who will show a God off badly if we fail to do that. We have a father who can handle the discipline issues. Listen, my dad never said to me, go discipline your brothers. Not that I didn't take it upon myself to try and do that sometimes. Do you see? Because I was the oldest. Never worked out well. 
God is capable. God is the Father. God is the one who will discipline. And he'll do it in the right time and he'll do it in the right way if we will give him room. And so James says, be patient, brothers and sisters. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. Patience. Now that inward attitude of patience leads to an outward behavior. The outward behavior is don't grumble. So you get your heart right. Attitude of forbearance is growing, hopefully. Then there's the behavior change that'll show it. Verse nine, do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. I mean, <laughs> I think we all love the thought of the coming of the Lord, don't we? So that all those evil people will get theirs. Now, is that, I mean, that's, that's part of the thing that we kind of look forward to, right? Forgetting that guess what? We're there too. We may be saved. Hopefully you are. Hopefully you belong to Christ. You will not face the judgment to determine whether it's heaven or not, but you will face a judgment. You say, how can you say that? You've always said Christians aren't judged. No, no, no. I said Christians are not going to face condemnation. They're not going to face a judgment of, is it heaven or hell for you? But there is a judgment for Christians. God says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, that there is a judgment for Christians. He says in Matthew 12, listen to this one, Matthew, Matthew 12, verse 36, he says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for what, their deeds? No, for every careless word they speak. It'd be bad enough if it was just deeds, wouldn't it? But it's not. It's also for every careless word. And I'll tell you what, he doesn't say it here, but it also extends to your thoughts. Because Jesus said, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And Jesus says, if you, you may not commit adultery outwardly and you pat yourself on the back, but if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've already done it. You think God missed that? No. And so there is a judgment for believers. And this whole idea of speaking wrong words has been a theme throughout James. You may have noticed it. I mean, you know, we sing about it. We have memory verses about it because it's, it's kind of there everywhere. And he's always saying, think twice. No, think three times before you speak. Watch your words. Be careful. Words count. And now he's saying, don't grumble. Just because somebody agrees with you, don't take it personal. We call it defending our rights. God calls it violating his character. present tense of this command, which is given here, do not grumble. Do not grumble means this was something that was going on to the people that James was writing to. It was going on in the back rooms. I think he used grumbling. He probably could have I used that. I think he used grumbling to get more at the heart of the issue. See, when things are coming out in the open and we got infighting going on out there in the open, it's because there's been grumbling going on underneath the surface, Right? So we may not say anything at church, but we go home and guess what? Boy, fried pastor for lunch, right? Or the pastor has fried elders for lunch, right? Or whatever. We grumble. Somebody's not keeping up their end of the bargain. Somebody's not doing what they should be doing. And so we grumble. Judging one another, letting bitterness grow. And when that happens, beloved, even if we're right, we're wrong, right? Even if we're right, we're wrong. This is tough. I, I promise you, you can't do this in your own strength any more than I can. This is a daily, minute-by-minute minute commitment of your life to the Holy Spirit and to the, to the guidance of the, to be spirit filled with the Spirit and to have the life of Christ being living, lived out through you. We think we're doing pretty well if we don't punch somebody out. Held our temper. We didn't take revenge. Had an opportunity and we didn't do it. But that's not what James says. He says, don't grumble. Grumbling is so easy. Grumbling, 
feels so good. It's grumbling is complaining. Grumbling is scorning. And usually it's behind the scenes. You know, grumbling is zinging people, griping, finding fault, saying things we wouldn't say to their face, but saying it behind their back, nitpicking. And James doesn't say, well, grumbling, that's not so bad as long as you keep it to yourself. He doesn't say that. He says, don't grumble. Don't let this be part of your existence. Don't let this be who you are. Don't grumble. And then he tells us why. Because the judge, who we've already seen, judges every careless word, that judge is at the door. That judge is hearing everything that's going on. That judge is listening. That judge is coming soon. And if you're not sorry now, you will be then. So just don't do it. Ask the Holy Spirit to clean up your heart and to clean up your act. We all need this. You know what grumbling is? I, I love this. Here's another take on it, just to, another way to maybe help you think about it. In John Milton's Paradise Lost, he has a great phrase. He says, a vote for Satan is a vote for hell. And by a vote for Satan, he means, you know, sinful actions, sinful thoughts, sinful deeds in our life. A vote for Satan is a vote for hell. And then he says this, and a vote for hell is endless biography. Endless biography. You know what that means? That means you're writing your own story. He says that's what, when you, when, when you're, whenever there's sin in your life, whatever it is, and grumbling is one of those things that now falls into that category. It's endless biography. What is it? It's endless about me. It's endlessly, here's how I see things. It's endlessly, here's what the right thing is from my perspective. It's endless biography. God help us if we could just get bored with ourselves sometimes, right? But we never do. If we don't put a stop to it and ask the Lord to put a stop to it, that's where we'll go. Endless biography. That's hell on earth. Absolute self-absorption. Writing my own story. Making my own way. Judging everybody else by what my opinions are and what I think is right. And James says, don't grumble. He's saying, get over yourself. Quit thinking about yourself, your own needs and your own desires. Think about somebody else's. Life treats you unfairly. Guess what? It treats everybody unfairly. Get over it. Give God room to operate and watch and see what he will do in your life. He says, if you don't get over it, the Lord is at the door. The judge is standing there. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 says, for we must all appear, and this is written to believers now, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And among other, other things, every careless word will be exposed. I, does, that, does that bother you to think that the words you say in private in your own home are gonna be revealed? Wow, that is tough. That's what's going to be. And what he's saying is, you want to avoid some, some embarrassment there. You know, the grumbling may feel good now. It isn't going to feel very good on that time, at that time. The judge is at the door. He knows. Listen, and it's not that God wants to zing us and that he's standing out there just to see how much he can get on us. That's not the point. That judgment is going to be this, the, the judgment where we'll get rewards and suffer loss. He doesn't want us to suffer loss. He loves us, but he can't overlook any of it. You see that? He can't be God if he does that. He's not doing it because he wants to see us unhappy. He's doing it because he wants us to see us happy. I love, I think I've shared this before too, but I love what was said of Thomas Cramner. He was the Archbishop of the Church of England during the time of the Reformation, during the reign of, reign of Henry VIII. It was said of Thomas Cramner, to do him any wrong was to beget a kindness from him. To do him any wrong was to beget a kindness from him. Oh, if we could only live like that. You're gonna do me wrong? Here's what you're gonna get back. I'm gonna do something good for you. What a great goal. Possible if the Holy Spirit is living our life through us. 
Let me close with one more example. Alexander Strzok is a pastor. He's approached after church one Sunday by somebody who was just, I mean, this guy was lit up, right? And he, he let him know in no uncertain terms that the special music that day was too loud. The longer he talked, the more red-faced he became. He eventually informed Strzok that he would face the judgment of Christ for allowing the music to go on this way and, to, and the young people to ruin his worship. Strzok says this, he says, for several minutes he gave me a good old-fashioned tongue lashing. He held nothing back. Then he took a breath, rested a few seconds and said calmly, well, at least you are an open-minded person. He turned, he walked away, and there has never been a problem between us since. I never said a word. I knew that if I started to argue, the situation would have escalated. Surely the Holy Spirit controlled my emotions, allowing me to stay calm and overlook his threatening talk and ungracious behavior. He put into practice, beloved, exactly what James is talking about. Now, it doesn't always turn out this wonderful, right? But we won't know how it'll turn out if we let God have the opportunity, unless we give God the opportunity, right? That's all he's asking. Give him a chance. How do you handle trouble? Be patient, steadfast, establish your heart in Christ, and don't grumble. That's your assignment for next week. Tough assignment? Yes. Impossible? Yes. Possible as we allow the Lord Jesus Christ to live his life through us? Yes. That's the new life we have in Christ. It's him living through us. And as he by grace has given us salvation, he by grace will establish our hearts and allow this kind of life to be lived through us. He says in Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. There's your incentive, there's your power, and there's your example. He did it for us, now he wants to do it through us. Some of us need, in the few moments that we take this morning, to check our heart. We need to examine what bitterness is there, what grudges we are holding, what desire to get even with people is on the tips of our tongues. What is it we haven't given over to God because we're holding on to it ourselves? So let's take a few moments to do that together as the team comes to lead us. Father, we thank you for this time, and we pray now that in these moments, as we give a little quiet time, that you will do the work in our life that we need to respond appropriately to what you've said to us this morning. Lord, we have been, every one of us, forgiven much. We have been forgiven much at great cost to you. So help us, having received the free gift of eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord that we never deserved and never will to pass on that same grace to others simply because you've asked us to do so. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.